colleagues and partners. Greetings from Singapore. I'm Lauren Sorkin, the Executive Director of the Global Resilient Cities Network. I really want to thank everyone for joining. I know that for many, it's the eve of Passover and Easter, and these are, <laughs> these are usually times of renewal and celebration around freedom uh, and new energies. And while a lot of us can't do what we would traditionally do, um, I hope that this online meeting is one of the opportunities we all get to feel really connected and celebrate our freedom to share openly with one another, one another and that that will give us renewed energy to keep managing through this, this crisis of COVID-19. Um, in the week since we connected last, the number of cases in New York and New Jersey, which is where I grew up, um, have actually eclipsed the next largest country. Um, and the country where I live in Singapore, uh, after initially uh, controlling cases, we're now in, in lockdown. So it's a real reminder that this crisis is not linear and we need to continue to adapt. And that really brings us to tonight's conversation. Um, as always, we're very, very grateful to the World Bank as our co-hosts of this meeting and we are joined tonight by two amazing chief resilience officers from both coasts of the u.s and these are truly women who are examples of adapting quickly in the face of covid and so before i turn the microphone over to Frances to properly introduce them i want to remind everyone again of the intention of this speaker series and also of the ground rules of these calls. The purpose of the speaker series is to have open and honest learning conversations between practitioners in governments and partners who are supporting those entities to confront COVID-19 and to save lives. So the calls are not on the record and we would ask that you not attribute any comments made today or questions asked to the speakers unless the materials have been made available after the call or unless you've specifically asked the person's permission to do so. So even with the holidays upon us, we have nearly 600 people registered for this call globally, which is really exciting. And I wanna remind everyone that with that number of participants, we use the Q&A function, which you will see on the bottom of your screen. Don't post the questions in the chat function. We're not really checking there. We're checking the Q&A function. So make sure that you're typing the Q&A there and we will have both of the presentations first and then move on to the Q&A. And with that, I wanna turn the microphone over to Frances from the World Bank. Thank you, uh, Lauren. Uh, welcome everyone on behalf of the World Bank and the City Resilience Program. Uh, Lauren, so my name is Frances Gessier. I'm a practice manager in the East Asia region. As always, we have two fascinating speakers today who will tell us about the response in two coastal cities on each side of the United States. Alex McBride is the Chief Resilience Officer of the City of Oakland. She will tell us about aspects of the response in that city and the broader Bay Area. And Amy Niles is the Chief Residence, uh, Residence Officer in the city of Miami Beach. She will tell us about aspect of the response in that city and the greater Miami area. So two major harbor, uh, two major commercial center, both cities at the center of large urban uh, cluster. And, and we know that uh, that brings additional complexities. Uh, we will uh, hear their presentation for about 20 minutes each. Uh, after which we will have the Q&A session. So uh, without uh, further ado, Alex, the screen is all yours. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, I am going to be sharing my screen and hopefully you'll be able to see it momentarily. Um, there we go. I'm going to start it off. Just confirming everyone can see the screen. Great. Uh, good morning to all. Thank you for the opportunity um, to, to chat with you all today. I've been on a, a call before. It's actually 5.30 in the morning here, uh, but it just shows my commitment and desire to really learn from this network and share. Uh, again, my name is Alex McBride, and I want to talk about how we are using our Emergency Operations Center, or our EOC, to leverage philanthropy and community resilience in Oakland. 
Um, just quickly, the quick agenda for this 20 minutes, I'll give a quick overview of the playbook, talk about where we are with our spread of COVID-19, and then I'll go into some of the specifics of our, uh, our work in the EOC. Um, I'll share a little bit of challenges and open questions, and then uh, just briefly additional resources. Um, so our uh, Resilient Oakland Playbook was released in 2016. Um, we have 36 actions that go against multiple categories. For those who aren't really familiar with Oakland, we have shocks and stresses that are similar to most large urban areas. We're dealing with uh, major disparities in socio socioeconomic um, health disparities among race here in Oakland, which is a major issue, and why we have building a trustworthy government as, a, as an important aspect of our work. Um, we also have lots of shocks like wildfires, earthquakes uh, that we also that the plan also in, or used to come up with um, the types of actions uh, that we uh, that we've made as goals here in Oakland. Um, and the work that I've been doing as a CRO for the last almost two years has really helped to to um, prepare uh, the city for some of the the issues we're experiencing today in this pandemic. Uh, this is a general uh, a statewide map of where we are on the uh, COVID-19 um, cases. Uh, so the city of Oakland is in the county of Alameda. So that's uh, if you're on the right side, it's maybe what, seven down. Um, we're, uh, as mentioned uh, by Francis, a part of the Bay Area, which is a, a, a regional um, sort of coalition of cities. San Francisco is a neighbor as well as Berkeley, who uh, were their two other CROs. And in Oakland in particular, uh, this is our Alameda County um, local health jurisdiction count of our cases here in Oakland. Um, Oakland as a city does not have a, a local health jurisdiction or medical officer, so we depend on the county to do this type of capturing of data. And as of yesterday, uh, across the county, there were six, 601 cases and 13 deaths. I will add that our county, along with uh, five other counties in the Bay Area, became the first in the nation to issue a shelter-in-place order on March 17th. Um, we, you know, sort of led the nation. We, as in our county leadership, uh, you know, saw this issue coming uh, and decided to make a, a, a decision that we see now based on a national trend and you know, the results of the Bay Area almost you know, starting to bend the curve, we see that as a really critical decision that was made early on. Um, we also, uh, Alameda County just last night, after I actually completed these slides, disaggregated these county stats to see our state cases. So Oakland right now has 149 cases. So just want to flag that we do have that information. But you're maybe seeing some of the challenges where you know we have a county collecting this information and, and getting that city information is, is, a, is a challenge and something that we're all trying to, to figure out as we're dealing with this pandemic. So Oakland, uh, the city of Oakland declared a local emergency uh, in, in early March. And with declaring a local emergency, as I imagine most cities uh, have we activated our emergency operations or EOC. Um, the EOC structure, uh, if you look on the right, that diagram is uh, has four main functions and this is according to uh, FEMA and you know other emergency management um, resources. Um, the EOC is set up as almost I think a streamlined structure in the government that just focuses on you know as I mentioned these four main functions and how to essentially adapt uh, as we're dealing with an emergency. We recognize, though, in the traditional EOC structure, there's not a, a, a space or a place for us to capture emerging community needs as they arise, particularly around residences and business. And, you know, it just was not a natural um, sort of fit in the structure. And I'll, I'll show in the next slide kind of what that structure looks like. And the city of Oakland also comes in with another perspective. We have some really recent lessons learned from our uh, October local emergency when we uh, in the Bay Area had a uh, public safety power shutoffs or um, our grid was shut down to prevent potential sparks from wildfire. Um, and that was a, um, a you know, major uh, shock to the city. Uh, it, it reinforced the disparities that lots of folks have, you know, people who are dependent on medical equipment 
people who couldn't afford to lose food in the refrigerator, you know, if the refrigerator goes off for a week. Um, so uh, we, we also kind of thought about what happened in October and um, use that input to come up with a um, next slide to come up with our community resilience unit in the EOC. So on the right side, this is the, um, of the chart or the right side of the slide, you see the top blue boxes are kind of traditional EOC structures. There's a director, there's a public information officer, and then there's these four sections, operations, planning, logistics, and finance. And you see a sort of twist on this in general, but they mostly follow this trend. Um, the decision was made to have a community resilience unit added in the operations section of the EOC. <clears throat> and, the, and the unit is led by myself as the chief resilience officer. Then I have two uh, delegates or two um, folks on my team, one focused on residents, one focused on business. Um, it seems sort of like a, a minor kind of box on an organizational chart, but uh, having experienced October and not really having a place in the EOC and now today where I'm a part of the structure and a part of the regular coordination across these different teams, um, we have, it's been a significant shift. Um, and, and, and I'll talk a little bit about some specific examples, but, you know, being a part of the EOC means I'm, have, I'm regularly coordinating with multiple, um, you know, sections. If you are familiar with the EOC environment, you're all in a big room um, uh, running around, constantly meeting and chatting. Uh, it is a, uh, it's a lot of energy, but it also is a great way to kind of cut through and answer questions really quickly and being there on the ground with our center director, who's our city administrator and our mayor, it just has really helped to um, ensure that these uh, resilient um, goals are infused in the way we're uh, reacting or uh, responding to the pandemic. Um, so the unit itself in community resilience, I, I added a couple of other units in the operations um, team so you can get an, an understanding of who else I'm working with. So there's a health and medical, unit uh, in, in the operations section. There's also a mass care and shelter. Um, and I did mention at the beginning a major stress on the Bay Area, uh, as many of you know, is homelessness and dealing with unsheltered residents. So we, uh, with this pandemic, are through the mass care and shelter unit and my coordination and community resilience are, you know, certainly and um, actively trying to ensure that we're addressing the most vulnerable residents and, and unsheltered being one of them. Um, and then the, the other unique part of the EOC is, um, uh, I, I also put on the chart our logistics um, uh, section, which I also coordinate very regularly with. Um, so most EOCs have a logistics section because uh, it's sort of an intake for volunteers or donations that are coming into the city you know, at the end of an emergency, for, um, we want to be able to account for what has come in and what has been donated. Um, so we coordinate very closely with that unit as well to ensure that um, resources are effectively uh, distributed to the most vulnerable residents. And my role has really um, grown a lot in our philanthropic donations um, and our uh, and the almost four million, five million dollars we've raised. And my role in the EOC has helped to inform that work. So speaking of the donations, I want to share a little bit about the Oakland COVID-19 Relief Fund. So um, the Oakland Fund is a mayor's fund. Most cities uh, or most mayors have uh, sort of this separate fund outside of the traditional city government. Our mayor uh, is happens to be really good at raising money and has great relationships. Um, Oakland is, you know, right next to Silicon Valley and major um, in the major tech sector. And in three weeks, our mayor has raised almost $5 million for the Oakland Fund. Um, we have, uh, and, and because of my role in the EOC and my um, sort of insight over community resilience, we've worked there. I've worked with my colleagues very closely in making sure that fund had some priority areas that we knew we needed to address, um, uh, mostly around food, homelessness, community health and education and economic security. Um, as I mentioned, the fund is not received by the city. So um, if you think about that last slide, the, log the logistics team takes in donate or monitors donations that are coming into the city. 
Um, so my role in, in a community resilience is more aligned with, um, when I'm talking about donations, I'm more aligned with the, the Oakland Fund, which is money that's not technically coming to the city, but uh, we as a city are able to give guidance to the fund and provide data and recommendations on where to invest. Um, uh, the third bullet, I, again, just to clarify, is not being received by the city, but I, I do think we had a really helpful tool, and if we're talking about real resources, at the end of the slide, I have a, a link to our emergency ordinance, which um, allows the city to have sort of conversations and exchange information with private sector and, and nonprofit sectors to kind of protect us because we're in this emergency state. Um, it allows us to um, be a little bit more active and, and have a closer partnership with, these, with this fund. Um, and another important element of this uh, this work and, and this fund and targeting the most vulnerable residents is ensuring that we're hearing from the most vulnerable residents and that we are incorporating that input directly. So uh, we also um, uh, formed a community advisory group uh, of um, community members in Oakland um, who uh, have affiliations with the types of vulnerable populations we're trying to target. And uh, that group is also going to inform our decisions around grant making. So we're doing all this with also the real goal of deploying rapidly resources. We need to get resources into the hands of people very quickly. And as early successes where you know, we saw within the first week of fundraising, uh, half a million um, of funding go to organizations like Meals and Wheels or other and other um, uh, service organizations that work specifically with homebound seniors and delivering food um, and with our unsheltered residents who um, require uh, an increased level of service and also um, require more, cre you know, more creativity about how to shelter these residents, particularly in the pandemic. Um, we also, within the first two weeks, were really excited about our, uh, our small business assistance fund. Uh, we were able to first launch a survey and in a week and a half get 1,100 responses from small business in the city of Oakland that were, that were in need and looking for financial relief or cash assistance, emergency cash assistance in this time. Um, you know, uh, 1,100, we were overwhelmed with the amount of responses we received. Uh, our resources, you know, could only uh, account for 10% of those, so we were able to get 90 um, small businesses, small grants, um, and these businesses are deeply, are really small and very reflective of the types of, of organizations we want to focus on. They're uh, majority owned by women or people of color and very small. We, we uh, consider small to be those that, are, have, that have annual revenues of less than $250,000. And our Oakland Business Assistance site has gotten a lot of traffic. We stood at that website within the first uh, week and a half. And our Department of Economic Workforce, um, Economic and Workforce Development, um, were, were critical in this work. Um, and we're partners in the Resilient Oakland Playbook already in thinking about how we could deploy resources to more vulnerable populations. So seeing you know, the preparation in um, what we call blue skies and how that uh, had a direct effect on how, we, how quickly we were able to respond has been um, really inspiring and, and really um, uh, uh, fortunate for the city. And then the most, uh, and the, the success I'll also dig into a little bit more is testing. Um, so we, through the philanthropic fund, were able to establish two testing sites in the last three weeks um, for first responders and essential workers. And this is a bit unique for a city, uh, like I mentioned before, that doesn't have a chief medical officer or a, a health department. Um, uh, but it's really based on public-private partnership and our mayor and city administrator really wanting to stand up uh, and um, support the county in getting testing out as quickly as possible. So our COVID-19 testing sites, um, we, as I said, established two testing sites our first site was established. Um, these weeks are merging in together, so I think like two weeks ago. Um, uh, and our first site was uh, targeting our first responders only. So within a couple of weeks, we were able to enter into a private partner, a public private partnership with the physician network in the Bay Area. Uh, that's where we got that medical expertise. 
that physician network came in with their staff, their nurse practitioners, their doctors, and the, and tests. And we, as a city, provided space, set up an outdoor area, um, uh, provided PPE, um, and then uh, at our at one of our um, fire stations here in the city, in a large parking lot in our training fire station, was we were able to start a testing site, one of the first testing sites deployed by a city in the nation. Um, and uh, I, I, the police officers and our, our fire department, who were firefighters that were responding to these incidences, um, just found this to be incredibly helpful for them. Um, and seeing how quickly we can scale our site right now uh, can, t can test 250 per day. Um, and because we had some capacity when we first launched for our first responders, we offered the service to our neighboring first responders uh, within our second week of operation. So our uh, neighbors in Berkeley and Piedmont and Alameda, the city of Alameda and others, the Port of Oakland, AC Transit, BART, um, we all extended an invitation for them to use our first responder site. And then just this Monday, and this is what the, uh, the on the right side you'll see sort of link. Just this Monday, we launched a new site for a, a larger, um, for larger public, for the larger public. Um, we're still following CDC guidelines of testing essential workers only. So that's healthcare, um, well, folks working in healthcare, but also for uh, people who are still doing essential services, everything from um, garbage pickup to our, our folks in restaurants still delivering takeout for folks who uh, are wanting to get meals uh, to our uh, service providers helping to support our unsheltered. Um, and this quote to the right is something we just, you know, in, in this moment of so much happening, it's also, you know, great to see when you, we are sort of, you know, doing what we can and um, hearing from one of our, um, our service providers who work in our shelters that, that say that this, you know, having the staff or knowing that staff can come and test for free, uh, whether they're insured or uninsured, um, really helps them to do their work. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we just launched the site um, a few days ago, and we have received a lot of press and a lot of positive uh, feedback. And this was all really done by our partnership with Brown and Tolan Physicians, which is the physician network here, and with funding from the Oakland Fund. And just finally, you know, the challenges and open questions, and this is more of questions out to the public, uh, but how are internally, um, you know, dealing with things like adjusting to the EOC structure and pace it isn't normally how we're working. Uh, so how do we keep up with uh, the, our, um, this, what looks like a really um, uh, a long path ahead, um, shifting focus from response to recovery and ensuring our staff feel safe and supported. And then just externally, we're hearing reports of sort of racial disparities, disparities being um, really doubled down on here in the U.S. African Americans are now suffering um, or dying from COVID-19 in um, faster rates than any other race. And that's uh, just reflective, again, of the uh, importance of uh, equitable outreach. And I know I'm over time, so I'm going to stop there and wait for questions. And I also have some resources that we could talk about later. But thank you so much for the opportunity to share. I just turned it back over uh, for Amy now. Yeah, thank you very much. Amy, the uh, screen is all yours. Okay, wonderful. So, all right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I am incredibly um, honored and humbled to be able to share our story. Uh, this morning with you and how we've been dealing with the COVID crisis down in Southeast Florida. Um, I know that there's nowhere in the world that's not um, dealing with this. Either you're suffering through it or worried about it. And um, so thanks for getting up early or staying up late for doing that. Um, I have listened to the different speaker series and um, I've shared many of these ideas with my own leadership team. So thank you to all of you on the line who have been sharing. Um, you'll see on the photo uh, on the left, on the presentation, um, a cover of our Resilient 305 strategy. Um, the city of Miami Beach was actually selected with Miami-Dade County, as well as um, the city of Miami a few years ago to be the first Resilient City Partnership. 
um, a has special hello to Jim Murley and Jane Gilbert and their teams who are probably on the line. Um, at the same time we released this Resilient 305 strategy for the region, we also released um, a strategic plan for the city of Miami Beach that really encompassed many of these actions and made sure that it was spread throughout our own city government. Um, in my role as CRO, I'm also head up uh, strategic planning. So this is a kind of a very helpful way to make sure that we're building resilience throughout. Um, so Miami Beach is a coastal city, of course, but we're part of a much larger um, county of 2.7 million people. And uh, we, as Miami Beach, are only at about 90,000. So we are kind of a, a smaller portion of that greater metropolitan. And I'll share a little bit about both of those stories today. Uh, Miami Beach is, uh, like many cities, no stranger to different shocks and stresses. And we've been through a lot of different disasters. Um, what you see before you, they're not COVID related, but they are definitely the shocks and stresses that we face. Um, we had a Hurricane Irma a few years ago. We had to deal with Zika, which is a mosquito-borne disease that crossed a lot of borders and, and was very threatening to us. Um, and those two incidents specifically really, um, though they tested us, they did teach us a few things. Um, they led us as a city to increase our uh, specific tourism reserves in our budget. Um, and it, that culture of preparedness is kind of how we, how we operate. On the right hand Amy, side, just so that you know, um, we're just catching up the slides. There was a little bit of a disconnect. So um, we're just catching up to you and we should be okay to go in a minute. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. All set. Okay, great. Um, so um, I think so you should see the, the slide right now that has sort of the four different pictures of different shocks and stresses. And then on the right hand side, um, although this isn't the focus of today, you know, sea level rise and climate change is one of our biggest stresses. And it's something that we're very much focused on and working on. Um, and it's just part of our culture as well. So resilience for us really is not an option. Um, it's definitely in our wheelhouse and it's, it's what we do and, and it's how we think. I'm gonna talk a little bit on the next slide about the Miami-Dade County uh, COVID case counts. So our cases have been growing. As you can see there, that um, orange line is the cumulative cases. We're currently over 5,000 cases in Miami-Dade County. We've seen 58 deaths, over 300 hospitalizations, and we're continuing to expand our testing. Uh, we don't feel that we have reached our peak at this point. So based on available modeling, we're looking at the peak coming between April 18th and mid-May. Um, we're also carefully watching the hospital bed capacity. Um, our, um, our hospitals have really been amazing, canceling all the elected surgeries and procedures to make sure that we have capacity for COVID-19. And this has also been a real financial hardship um, on the, the healthcare community because it's, it's meant some huge um, financial hardships for them also. But we do believe that this preparing is incredibly important um, to get ready in case we do see this surge. So I'll also highlight some of our shocks and stresses uh, that we have, um, that we're experiencing here. So I, I highlighted, we feel pretty good about um, our experience. We've been issuing emergency orders almost daily. Um, we have been preparing and issuing quick actions and I'll walk through some of those. We have really strong and formal relationships among Miami-Dade County. And then like many cities, we have, um, we hear a lot from residents and the businesses in our community and that gives us immediate dialogue that we can act on. Some of the challenges that we have is really access to data, really understanding the spread of this in the community. Um, testing sites have been increasing, um, but we have a lot of catch up to do. Availability of PPE has been a main focus for our, our departments. Um, it's, it's been a little scary worrying about when we might run out. Um, that's beginning to come in, but that has definitely been a challenge. Um, for Miami Beach, because we are a tourism city, this has very much been a, a community financial crisis, but it's also a city government financial crisis. Uh, many of our funds are tied to the tourism economy. Actually, 10% of our overall general fund is tied to the tourism economy. Um, so that, that's a challenge already. But I think the unknowns and how long this might last is concerning to everybody as well as we have hurricane season right around the corner. So we're giving a lot of thought to that. Um, the next slide shows a spring break and you've got a nice little picture of what spring break looks like and then what the beach looks like now. 
Um, Miami Beach is a vacation mecca. We have about 16 million visitors a year, and most of them actually stay on Miami Beach. Um, now, what you don't see here is that we have, um, our EOC was actually activated for spring break since we're so accustomed to these uh, major events. It really kind of positioned us to be ready and to be focusing on COVID-19. Um, so it became apparent very quickly that, that, that they were not going to social distance. And one of the actions that we did have to take uh, pretty early on was closing the beach. Again, very difficult because of that economic impact, but important to do for the health crisis. The next slide, it just walks through some of the different emergency orders that we've looked at. Um, the first case we saw in Miami-Dade County, probably around, uh, I think, March 11th, and we immediately took action and uh, the city of Miami Beach issued the first order, which really began to follow CDC guidelines to restrict um, the number of people at different events. So we tried to cap uh, events to 250 or below, and that, that felt like a really big deal at the time. And um, now looking at how many actions we've taken in the last month. Um, it, it's, it's pretty humbling to see that we thought that was a big deal. And now we're at the point where we have issued a safer at home order. We are requiring people to stay at home unless they're engaged in essential activities. Um, most recently, we did carry out the order to require employees and customers of people within essential businesses to be wearing a covering on their nose and mouth at all times. I wanna talk a little bit about um, the city's vulnerable populations. Um, we're very much focused on our seniors. We have about 15,000 residents over age 65. Um, we have uh, public school service lunches that are um, delivered and 75% you know, of our children are actually on free or reduced lunches. So we had to make sure that um, this is something that could be handled. Um, we have a, a community and housing team that really very quickly uh, mobilized meal delivery. We have areas where seniors were coming together to congregate and have meals, and that had to really be stopped right away. So again, sort of that shifting and agility from staff has really, uh, has really been amazing in working together. Uh, we even had parks department staff um, who were really kind of not working because the recreational programs were closed, calling out to our seniors to check on them, to see if they needed anything, um, to make sure they knew that, that we were there for them. Um, and during spring break, we also had that same park staff come and, and hand out food to children who weren't going to be able to be getting their daily, their daily pickups being out of school. We did receive some excellent response from that and we're continuing to monitor and, and provide help for this community. Um, something else I think it's been pretty interesting on Miami Beach is that very early on our fire chief um, developed a fire response unit of COVID only responders who are stationed at our local hospital, Mount Sinai. Um, they've been very careful, fire and police, to be spreading um, this disease uh, to limit the spread, um, being very proactive there. And they've had really, really good success so far with that. Um, uh, the police also have a team. They, uh, it's interesting, I had asked for some stats on crime yesterday, and at least in one specific area of the city, um, we are monitoring the crime. We're seeing that it's decreasing across the city. Again, people are, are home. We don't have the tourists. We don't have the events. But um, a little bit of a silver lining there that it's taking that pressure off of the police department. Um, I also have a picture of the, um, our local uh, grocery store. And you can see people wearing masks. And one new focus of the code compliance office has been every single day monitoring and enforcing these new guidelines. Um, the information comes out so quickly. It's a lot for people to handle and we're making sure that they're, they're following all the guidelines and their calls have gone up um, dramatically, of course, to deal with, to deal with all of this. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the hospitality industry. Um, it became apparent very soon that restaurants were among the first to close and began laying off, off staff, um, perhaps furloughing staff, um, repurposing staff to be doing takeout and delivery. Um, instead of actually operating as a, as a restaurant. So one of the first things we did was develop a daily business task force. And this has been really a, an incredible tool that we participate in as staff to listen to the immediate concerns, to listen to the, the issues our, our businesses are facing. And in response to that, we developed a resource center for those that had been unemployed um, for, from the hospitality industry, as well as our own city government. So we repurposed about 20 staff in order to help people through how to find um, unemployment benefits, access to all the different federal programs. 
um, that's that's been a really important effort for us and um, it's been really successful and one of the the first things we did once we realized that the state unemployment uh, system was down and not able to even handle the amount of people applying for unemployment is that we we uh, our city clerk actually printed out the applications and um, we will mail them to people's house um, with stamps and everything so that they can get um, that into the state. Um, we've also have been having meetings with specific hotels and the hotel industry and um, they're they're very clear that this is devastating but I, I've been particularly impressed by their desire to open when the time is right. Uh, we do understand their needs as a city and I think that's really important as we consider reopening and as we consider uh, recovery. So they're, they're very clear that their ability to reopen depends on employees being able to have their uh, dependent networks ready like the trans transportation network, child care, etc. They're not quite sure what they're going to find for the supply chain. Um, they, they believe, you know, they're, they're their materials will be out there, but again, until they, they sort of draw on all the different suppliers, they're not quite going to know. Uh, one big point that they've brought up is that the need to clean and disinfect and hand sanitizer is gonna be uh, important. It's gonna be expected by um, their different customers as they, as they begin to come back online. And they've thought about how they would reduce the capacity in their open spaces and how they would um, address things like valets who may potentially need to wear masks and gloves for a long time. Um, gyms and spots might be the last to open and they might need to have full-time personnel in areas to ensure disinfection. So they, they see this coming. Um, I've been incredibly impressed by their desire to prepare for this and their desire to open um, correctly when the time is right. Um, I'm, I'm sharing here a picture of our Miami Beach Convention Center. This is a, a new, uh, brand new convention center um, that was renovated uh, massively uh, last year and it was opened. Um, and for us on Miami Beach, we do have a, a pretty interesting story of back in World War II when we were actually had the military occupy Miami Beach and hotels and condos were turned into military barracks and offices and uh, the beach and the parks were transformed into shooting ranges and boot camps for training. So we had about 500,000 army soldiers occupying the city and um, you know we bounced back from that. So this is something that we've referred to um, as as a city and when we think about this and, and repurposing our facilities. What you can see here is the NFL experience from um, January of this year. We had about 80,000 people come through that convention center. I'm never imagining that yesterday we would be um, beginning to open the convention center as an alternative care hospital uh, for COVID patients. That was announced yesterday by, by our governor and our mayor and it's, it's pretty humbling to see this repurposing um, as a city, we're behind it. It's, it's uh, really, really important. It's intended to be a medical surge hospital. And I can tell you, this is kind of right across the street from City Hall and it's, it's, we're pretty much in awe that this is happening so quickly, but also thankful that we have this, this ability. I wanted to share a couple of, of fun items on here. Uh, we still are trying to keep people's spirits up, whether it's employees or whether it's the community. Um, our environmental team is, an, is incredibly creative and they've been hosting webinars called Sustainachella, where um, you can call in and learn about all sorts of ways to be sustainable and resilient. Um, they were even diagnosing people's houseplants on their last, um, their last event that they held. And that's something they're going to open to the community to celebrate throughout Earth Month. Um, we also uh, kind, of, kind of fun, instead of holding our annual um, egg celebration, we're going to be bringing bags, Easter bags, to different uh, families that register through our system. So again, let's, uh, we're thinking about different innovative ways to keep people connected through this time. Uh, this is also, I, you know, I talked about that silver lining before. This has been a very unique time to look at our environmental resources, our natural resources, and see how they are faring without the pressures of population and use. Um, we are doing water quality monitoring and are, are very interested to see what those results will look like. Since our beaches are closed, there's been a lot of extra activity in cleaning them and sifting them and getting them ready for sea turtle season. And we do expect to see more nests and more activity during this time. Um, we're en enhancing cleaning of our systems and um, just overall different uh, efforts are being set up to monitor our, our wildlife. 
And I want to shift a little bit and talk about um, what a resilient recovery looks like on Miami Beach. Um, Lauren had asked me to specifically talk about this, and, and this is some, some role that I think is very important for CROs to be involved with. Um, we, we're in this crisis right now, and our emergency managers are thinking day to day and responding um, to the issues of the day, and that's incredibly important. I'm personally involved in, in all of those meetings or, or on meetings every morning for about three hours or so or responding. Um, but I am constantly thinking about how we're going to recover. And so I personally have done a lot of research in that area. I have spent uh, time with every single one of our directors uh, individually to talk through um, what recovery might mean to them, how prepared they feel that they've been, what are the lessons learned, um, and how can we build resilience for the next, for the next shock. So for us, the recovery framework is very much about the community, um, our localized needs, and then, and then preparing. We do know as part of recovery that caring for the vulnerable and unemployed is gonna be continuing for quite some time. Um, and that's gonna be incredibly important. This is, this is something we've never seen before with the amount of people unemployed and the impacts that that can have. Uh, for number three, we're definitely maximizing our access to federal and state programs. Um, through the Resource Center, we're making sure that people can access those programs. We have written letters to our delegations um, with Miami Beach asks, and, um, and actually San Francisco is very helpful in sharing how they did that with us as a city, and we've modeled after that. We are thinking about a phased return that will minimize the public health uh, threat, and then again, making sure that we're focusing on understanding how all these dependencies are related. So we, have, we are thinking about what we can open first, what will open last, and how we can uh, keep those that are um, more vulnerable, more protected. Um, and finally, we do know that this is gonna be a very different culture, that we will have um, higher standards of cleaning and disinfection just in our, in, our, in our places that we're in charge of as a city, and that it's also going to be expected of um, all of the other places, especially in the tourism economy. Um, and, then, and then finally, we know it's going to be very important to manage expectations. Um, the financial scenarios are pretty dire, and we know that it's going to take some time for our community to, to reopen and to recover. Um, as a city, this is going to be a long storm, as we're saying. Uh, we will be seeing service adjustments. Uh, we have had to already um, lay off our temporary and part-time staff, uh, our parking fund has uh, really stopped having any income and we have had to furlough that staff and the management team is already um, taking furloughs as well. So we know that this is coming um, because my role is in strategic planning. We're also looking at what kind of projects are going to be um, continued that are vitally important, what kinds of projects are going to be perhaps delayed and what we might need to put on uh, just on hold at this time. So that's something else that, that I'm specifically working on. Um, and then finally, we, we know that hurricane season is coming. So our EOC is planning for that right now. And what uh, that might look like is, um, is definitely a challenge. Um, evacuating people who are supposed to be staying home and going into a shelter uh, would be a, a massive challenge for us. And we're, we're thinking about contingency planning for that. Um, and then finally, with our joint Resilient 305 um, strategy, um, Jim and Jane, my fellow CROs and I have come together to examine what kind of shared strategies we need to push forward and elevate that will help quicken recovery. Um, just a very simple one as an example is moving forward the need to respond to the census and we even despite all of this happening with COVID, we, re we realize it's incredibly important to bring funding and money into our cities. Um, we have other financial uh, safety net programs that we're working on that again perhaps need to be absolutely accelerated during this time. So with that, I think I'm about done with my time. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity and um, feel free any of you to reach out to me with any questions about any of these, these programs or my role here on Miami Beach. Thank you, Amy, and thank you again, Alex. I'm gonna jump right in because there are a number of fantastic questions for you both. Um, the first one is for both of you and it's around vulnerable communities. So the questions, and I'm gonna combine a few here, are how did you know which communities to prioritize given the COVID crisis? And how did you mainstream their, um, 
vulnerabilities and how to address them in the work of the EOC. And then related to that, how are you measuring the effectiveness of these measures to target your vulnerable communities? Have you experimented with new kinds of engagement channels um, in these very challenging times? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I, yeah, I, do you want to go first, Amy? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. You got up earlier today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess the first, how do we define vulnerable populations? It's, you know, we use a couple of factors. First, obviously, our, the CDC, the health, looking at who was most affected, um, which we knew were seniors. Um, we knew our unsheltered uh, based on the pandemic and not being able to have access to running water to wash their hands. I mean, there were lots of health related um, uh, reasoning to why we, why, why we prioritize vulnerable communities. But we also have relationships, and this is what the Resilient Oakland Playbook and our, our sort of city in general has done, including with our Department of Race and Equity, which does now an analysis every couple of years to understand the racial disparities among um, things like the, the rate of asthma and how African Americans are more likely to have asthma in the city of Oakland or um, looking at uh, underemployment. So we also knew where to target um, first geographically and which groups to target that we knew would be most hit by the economic impacts of a shelter in place in this pandemic, as well as the health impacts in ways that we're seeing now, as I mentioned, play out um, in a, on a national scale. So we're looking at the racial disparities in the response uh, and the reaction to COVID-19. In the EOC, that's looked um, like a couple of things. We have, for example, tons of volunteers who want to want to come in and play a role. Um, and it's been really inspiring to see Oaklanders stand up. And we have been really thoughtful about how to use those volunteers while because we're mapping in those vulnerable populations. Um, Oakland is actually one of the most diverse cities in the nation. Uh, we have uh, so many, um, I think right now we translate our materials in about seven languages and I put our um, are uh, one of those resources on my slide. So we have volunteers helping to do translation services. We're doing um, phone calls and focusing on seniors. So we've used the EOC to target resources like volunteers. Um, and then the, the COVID relief fund has been a very real uh, place where I'm taking inputs from the EOC. Um, for example, we just, uh, the state, as you may have heard, procured or uh, got leases with two large hotels to house our unsheltered residents. We're thinking about what other services we can overlay on that. It's because it's not just about housing. We're, we're thinking about recovery. What's happening after? What, can, what services can we provide um, while we bring residents in to support that work? So that's another example of the types of connections we're able to make um, because we're in the EOC every day. Um, well, for Miami Beach, I would say that um, we we have pretty strong um, communication channels already. Um, so our, our city survey is actually under me as well, and we we exceed all sorts of um, I think uh, satisfaction benchmarks for how we communicate with our public. So we have a lot of two way communication already. Um, but I would say definitely for this um, for our, our most vulnerable population, which is for us as our seniors. Um, when our fire department has done a call that we this suspected COVID, we actually have had fire inspectors coming right behind them to make sure that the different residential areas are completely disinfected and cleaned and sort of that follow up and tracking to make sure that we know um, that, that they're being as safe as possible and we're very concerned about uh, containing spread there. Um, our, for our hospitality industry, I mentioned that we created uh, this resource center. So we're very much tracking all those different calls and they do inform our policy and what we're doing. Um, we also have a, just an overall call center that people can email, they can call, and we're tracking those and we report those every single morning. Um, we don't have a formal EOC set up, it's a, it's a level two, so we're calling in. Um, but that's that's some of our one of our big ways. Our, our mayor is also extremely uh, social media savvy, and he's done a lot of very short videos. Every time there's a new emergency order, he gets on and he really explains that, and it's sent out through all channels. And I think um, that's that's been really important um, in other webinars to help people. So those are just a few of the items that we've done. Thank you, Alex and Amy. Uh, a second. Uh, group of question where I try to bring questions together, but I think we, we all are facing a particular challenge uh, with resources being reallocated quickly 
to try to response, respond to the emergency between today and tomorrow, between response and recovery, between response and long-term resilience. Amy, you, you touched on the need for Miami to prepare for the upcoming uh, hurricane season. Alex, you, you, you didn't talk about it, but in both cities, who decides is this a topic that is already being discussed or it's too early even to, to try to uh, address those questions? Maybe Alex first and then Amy. Well, yeah, I mentioned the PSP, uh, the public safety power shutoff, because we know that that's a likely scenario that's coming again, where, um, and we're trying to think now, what does it look like if seniors being our most vulnerable residents are also dependent on medical equipment that may not be powered um, if we're, if safety is, if, if, we, if we're experiencing shutoffs. Um, we're also dealing with the potential wild, you know, wildfire season coming, season coming soon and air quality effects. So we're we're figuring that out. I think it's an op it's an open question. What what we are doing though, because of the, how recent our response was back in October, that's definitely on the on our minds, and we're trying to do that pre work now to ensure we are keeping a very up to date list of those with medical depend you know those who are medically dependent on equipment, for example, so that we know how or how to deploy. We also are using um, you know purchasing generators and. Um, you know, before all this happened, resilience hubs was, uh, was thinking about how we can have hubs that were renewably powered or more sustainably powered is something that we're considering. We still are trying to get that done in the midst of this uh, emergency. So it's a challenge of just really trying to balance both, but it's certainly on our radar. Um, well, I would say for Miami Beach, we are very carefully tracking all of our um, hours so that it can be submitted to uh, FEMA for reimbursement. I mean, we're going to be heavily, heavily uh, focused on obtaining the most federal and state funds as possible. Um, there's no way that as a locality we can withstand it without it. And then I think the same approach we'll have towards the hurricane season. Um, we'll, be, we'll be relying on that. Um, but, you know, like, like I said, we we have, a, we have a very strong leadership team. We meet every morning and the CFO is part of that meeting. So, I mean, we, we know sort of the, the amount our revenue um, is, has been reduced. We're um, doing all sorts of cost cutting measures. We don't know what next year's budget is going to look like, but as of now, we're, we're, we're losing about $3 million a week. Um, so that's adding up very quickly. So again, it's part of a, a bit of that challenge and that uncertainty and we're, we're taking those shorter term actions and then, and then monitoring. So a question that is related, but uh, along a different path, something that you uh, touched on, Amy and Alex, you alluded to this less on overlapping shocks, but more on the shocks and stresses that Oakland's facing. One of the questions that was posed is, what, what would we be looking at in terms of those potentially concurrent shocks? And how do you start to think about that? Are there pathways, plans, strategies, or tools that either of you would recommend to other cities that are thinking about this, whether it's you know earthquake and COVID, whether it's hurricanes, typhoons and COVID? How, how would you recommend thinking about that? Um, I'll go first this time. Well, I, I already asked our emergency manager about the hurricane question and you know, there, there's two sides to it because right now our infrastructure in terms of transportation is much less stressed because people aren't driving. You know, the streets are open. Um, we, we have such an issue with congestion and we have so many visitors and tourists that, that are coming that that adds a lot of stress. So we actually, we don't have that right now, which is, um, you know, a, a blessing and a curse. But if in the event that we do have to evacuate, there will be much less people to be uh, worried about at this time, understanding there's still the the public health concern, of course. Um, but th those, those conversations are underway. And the only thing I would say is that getting through all this, the relationships are very important. So having all your departments there, you know, working for us, it's working across Biscayne Bay with our partners and the county and, and the city and, and, and the state. Um, those, those partnerships are there and we're in frequent contact. So I think that it would help us to be ready as well. And I would just add one specific thing we're looking at is our staffing for our Oakland Fire and Police. Um, in this, with COVID, uh, we're not at peak yet, 
Um, so if we're dealing with potential impacts to staffing, um, how that might affect uh, looking like something at PSCS where our first responders were heavily relied upon um, to get information out, to knock on doors, to ensure people in, in, in areas where the power was shut off needed help. So we have had some conversations about scenario planning for staffing and thinking about ways to, um, you know, what, what staffing models would look like in the worst case scenario where people are self-quarantined um, because of potential impact or exposure to COVID. Thank you, uh, Amy and Alex. Uh, my question, my next question is in line with my previous one. We talked about uh, reallocation of funds and trying to look at a, the positive. We will get out eventually out of this crisis. Thinking about recovery, and both of you are already thinking about it, obviously, you, uh, uh, Alex, are you, you, you're trying to keep Main Street afloat, offering small grants, uh, grants to small businesses and other activities. Amy, you mentioned that you uh, already interviewed many of the directors to, to start thinking about it. What do you think will be the first critical action that, or, or which critical action would you recommend to, to other cities you think would be, would be essential when we, when we start the recovery? I would say, um listening i mean so what what you a term we used to use a lot was planning fatigue um before all this happened we were asking the same communities the same questions over and over again of like what would you like to see how can we support you what are your needs and every time we write another plan we'd ask those questions again um we're really trying to be as thoughtful as we can because of the extensive outreach we're doing and in, in, in ways like mostly online or over the phone how are we capturing the data and lessons learned so that we can return to community with responses to what we're hearing? Um, you know, the, even though we, we had 11, I mentioned the 1,100 small businesses we heard of, we could only, you know, help fund 10%. But how are we engaging these folks and, you know, how are we co-creating solutions based on the extensive outreach that this, this is uh, initiated? So um, that, that would be sort of, that's one thing of, or approach we're trying to take, what can we learn from now um, so that we can, we can say that we're listening to the public and not asking the same questions over and over. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's all incredibly important. I think that the first thing for any city to do, and if you haven't already, and I'm sure you have, is just to establish dialogue with different types of groups, consistent dialogue, and use that to inform your immediate actions and the policies that you develop. Um, I, I can't tell you how helpful it's been to um, have that direct connection with the hospitality industry. Um, you know, uh, you know, with with the seniors, we have a, a specific person that's reaching out to the schools every day and understands what's happening there with the needs from families being at home. So I think just establishing all of those is huge. And um, I, I, our emergency manager is is great and I appreciate and understand the emergency management structure, but I particularly didn't want to wait until an after action till this is all over to begin to collect those lessons learned and how we're going to do things differently. So um, I just think having those those conversations as a CRO, you have a really unique ability in your city um, to reach out across the city and, and have these one on ones that others just they don't have time. It's not even um, they don't have the headspace. And so that's really important. Um, and then what I'm doing is sharing that information with my um, my city manager, who I who I report to. And then you know we're taking action. And it could be something small, uh, for example, you know developing an approach to really how we're telecommuting at home. And it could be something much bigger, uh, like thinking about how we are going to handle supplies and preparation much differently for the next event. So. Uh, that's something I think has been has been valuable to do and collect uh, now and, and not wait till this this is over. I think I now have the unfortunate duty of starting to draw us to a close. Um, but I think the notes that both um, Alex and Amy were just ending on are really critical in terms of having foresight, keeping strong relationships. Um, and connecting across disciplines. And so I did want to remind everyone that even though there were many, many questions that we didn't have time to answer live, we are collecting these questions and we're curating responses to them 
um, with our cities, with our staff. And so um, when you have the headspace and the time, you can access those resources as well as these full presentations and all of the previous presentations online. Um, we will meet again at this uh, same time next week. Next week's presentation is going to be about the crossroads of informality and COVID-19. Um, so we hope that many of us will join you for that presentation. I want to just give a huge, huge thank you um, to Alex and also to Amy for joining us very early and very, very early in the morning um, in, in the US on the East and West Coast, in particular, um, right in, in the middle of this crisis and managing it and playing such important roles that both of you are playing. So thank you for that. Thank you for your generosity um, of time and, and of knowledge. And also to everyone who signed in um, tonight or afternoon or morning, thank you all for spending this time with us. We appreciate it and we'll continue uh, to convene. Thanks so much. And for all of those celebrating, have a very happy holiday. Thank you.